My name is Naomi Nix. I'm a reporter for the Washington Post, where I cover social media. And I focus a lot on how social media impacts our world. And lately, that's meant covering this larger conversation that we've been having among parents, among activists, among regulators about whether our youth are really safe online and how tech companies can bolster their safeguards to protect our kids. We've had the US Surgeon General warn that you know our teenagers are in a mental health crisis and that might be partially to blame because of the time they spent on social media. Dozens of state attorneys generals are suing Meta, alleging the company is compromising their mental health. And just last month, we had the Senate Judiciary Committee grill some of our biggest tech CEOs about how they're protecting kids online. It's clear that there might be a problem here. I think it's less clear what the right solution is. There's a lot of disagreement about that. I expect we'll hear some disagreement about that this morning. Um, but here to sort of dive into some of those tricky questions about how we protect youth while preserving freedom of speech and privacy. We have an esteemed panel of guests. I'll briefly introduce them, and then I'll ask them to introduce themselves at length. Um, so we have John Carr. He is the secretary of the UK Children's Charity Coalition on Internet Society. We have Haley Hinkle. She's a policy counsel for Fair Play. We have Maureen Flatley. She is a Stop Child Predators advisor. Um, and then we have Daniel Castro. He's the vice president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. So why don't we just start, I'll have you introduce yourselves briefly and talk a little bit about what your organization does. John, you want to start? OK, yeah. So <clears throat> I'm a Brit, as you might have gathered from my uh, accent. Um, and I'm very glad to be here, to see many old and familiar faces, particularly my old friend Rick Lane is there. Um, I was very distressed, however, because the 49ers recently acquired and became the owners of my football team um, in England, Leeds United. So I'm beginning to worry about the knock-on effects of last night. So if anybody's got any tips or clues, please see me at the break and let me know. So I work with, uh, I, I, I'm advisor to the British government. I've advised the Council of Europe and um, <clears throat> the United Nations, various bits of the United Nations, uh, but above all, children's organizations in the UK with a particular focus on digital technologies. Morning all, my name is Haley. I am policy counsel at Fair Play. We are a children's media and marketing watchdog focused on the ways in which big tech's business model and the excessive screen time it encourages impact kids' healthy development. I'm Maureen Flatley. Uh, I have spent the last almost 40 years engaged in oversight and government reform of issues related to children across a range of systems. Um, I always tell people that one of the most formative experiences of my life was being the daughter of an FBI agent who spent most of his career detailed to the Senate Racketeering Committee, where he developed testimony against La Casa Nostra with Joe Valachi. And that proved to me, with my own eyes, for most of my childhood, that Congress can solve big problems involving criminals. And I think at the end of the day, my point of view on this issue is that this is not fundamentally a technology problem. This is fundamentally a crime problem. And by ignoring that for far too many years, we have now created a problem that seems almost insurmountable. But I hope today that we talk a little bit about some concrete solutions. Thanks. And I'm Daniel Castro, Vice President of ITIF, uh, Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, which is a nonprofit think tank focused on innovation. I've been doing a lot of work uh, generally on tech policy and the internet economy and how it works, as well as the metaverse and children's safety online and in these kind of emerging platforms. I agree 100% with Maureen on, on this point that I think this isn't a technology issue and we tend to wrap these up um, and intertwine these things when they're not there. So hopefully we'll get into that today. <clears throat> I'm sure we will. Um, I want to start with the hearing. You know, I've been covering tech for a long time in Washington, and that was probably one of the most emotional hearings I've ever covered, in part because we did have families show up and talk about um, the experiences of young people who had lost their lives to suicide or found drugs on online platforms. 
Um, and yet, even though it was very heightened, there was also a lot of like blame shifting, right? We had lawmakers accuse the tech companies of having blood on their hands for not doing more, and then also sort of criticize themselves for not passing legislation, even in that poignant um, you know, uh, question answering session with Senator Josh Hawley, you know, Mark Zuckerberg said uh, the company had a lot of parental tools, implying that like parents could play a role in protecting their kids. Amid sort of all of that, uh, all of the various proposals and all of the various diagnoses that happened in that hearing, just to sort of start us off in broad strokes, I'm wondering if each of you can talk a little bit more about what you see as sort of the top risk we're facing right now when it comes to youth safety online, and who and what would be your sort of first biggest step that you think should happen right now? And Dano, you want to start us off? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, watching that hearing, you can't come away with anything other than thinking it's political theater and in, in probably the worst possible way because, I mean, we're seeing, you know, parents there with real issues that impact children. You know, like you said, I mean, suicide, self-harm, uh, eating disorders, I mean, so much um, that affects so many people. And the solution to those problems are not going to be, you know, the, the top solutions, which these are very complex issues. Technology is not at the top of that list, right? We have bullying problems. We have, you know, problems of um, addiction uh, in communities uh, with drugs and overdose and, and all these issues. And, you know, when you, when you look at that, you realize that the purpose of that hearing Again, in, in my, my opinion watching this, it's, it's not to advance solutions that will actually help children in the end. It's to advance legislation that's intended to regulate big tech. And it's using children and children who are, who are suffering to advance that narrative and to advance legislation. And we've seen this successful playbook in the past, which is why it's being used again today. We've seen it with SESTA-FOSTA. It was the same issue where nobody wanted to oppose it because, you know, who was going to be on the other side of that issue. And I think that's what we're seeing with um, children's online safety. There are legitimate issues, and there are issues that we can address. But if we think that the reason that these, you know, again, addiction, self-harm, the reason these things are happening are because of technology platforms, that's not the reason. And it's distracting from real solutions. Maureen, do you have anything to add about, just in broad strokes, what you see as sort of the most urgent priority right now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, I've been to hundreds of congressional hearings in my career, and I have to say that I, I was really appalled at the framing of the hearing last week, which I did attend. It was as if you know, the panel was blaming the tech industry for everything from global warming to kidnapping the Lindbergh baby. I mean, it was just so over the top. It was not an exercise designed to come up with solutions. <clears throat> it was a show trial. There wasn't a panel that had any kind of affirmative uh, input at all. And, you know, I was thinking about this last night, and I thought, you know, if I had been Mark Zuckerberg, what would I have said to that panel? And I actually wrote it down. So this is what I would have said. I would have said, Congress has had 16 years to implement the PROTECT Act. It was a virtually perfect first step to building an infrastructure around law enforcement to mitigate all of the things that we're seeing today. Yet. In a recent GAO report, which if you haven't read it, I recommend it highly, they issued a scathing indictment of DOJ for failing to implement this really important bill. Congress hasn't held any really meaningful oversight hearings. DOJ hasn't issued any real reports. It's, I mean, child exploitation isn't even on their list of priorities. And as someone who grew up in a family with a father who worked for DOJ. I've always had the highest respect for that agency, but I have to tell you that in a universe of institutional players who are responsible for what we see before us today, the Justice Department is at the top of the list, at least as far as I'm concerned, closely followed by Congress, which has failed to do its job, which is authorize appropriate and overseas spending. The tech companies are mandated reporters, just like teachers and pediatricians, pastors and daycare providers. 
all mandated reporters in other contexts are specifically shielded from civil liability because if they weren't, we would never get any meaningful reporting. But if you look at the list of cyber tips, virtually all of them come from tech companies. The number one reporter of cyber tips is Meta. And meanwhile, no one even bothered to ask the owner, the founder of Meta, what would be helpful to them to prevent the proliferation of this activity on their platforms. I don't know how many people live in Washington, but remember when the Columbia Heights CVS was swarmed by shoplifters and, and, and so badly that they're now closing that store? Nobody blamed CVS for the shoplifters, right? They called the police. And in this instance, I'm waiting for somebody to say, hey, Tech companies are, are private companies. They can't arrest or prosecute anybody. They, they post those cyber tips dutifully every year, year in and year out. And yet, they can't provide the public safety response to them that is needed. And quite frankly, when you look at what is really going on here and what happens to those tips, they're geolocated and they're referred to countries all around the world. And again, if we're looking to mitigate the problem, we have to look at the underlying crime problems. No tech company is going to be able to combat the sextortion ring that is, for instance, the Yahoo Boys, a Nigerian-based gang that is operating in probably 25 different countries. When I listen to those parents in their anguish, and believe me, I have worked with hundreds and hundreds of victims. When I discovered in 2006 that the civil penalty to download a song was one third the civil penalty to download CSAM. I got John Kerry to write the bill that fixed that in six months, tripling the civil penalty. So it's not that I'm unsympathetic, but I'm saying that blaming the tech companies for a global crime problem is not a path to success here. It just isn't. So, so law enforcement could play a bigger if, role. If I, if I were Mark Zuckerberg, I would have been asking a lot of questions. And one last observation, as long as we're on the subject. When I look at the plaintiffs that are suing Meta, most of them have been sued themselves for poor child welfare outcomes. Several of them, horrendous child welfare outcomes. So any suggestion that these individual state claims against Meta are somehow on the moral high ground with respect to outcomes for children don't make me laugh. So we, at the end of the day, we really need to sort of refocus this conversation and look at what's really going on here and work with the tech companies. Because anger is not a strategy. Conflict is not a strategy. Whatever this is, whatever is going on right now is not working, and it's certainly not helping kids. Thank you. Great. Um, so I would say um, my framing of the problem you know, at Fair Play and, and with our fellow advocates is is this, which is that the incentives are such that these platforms are using uh, kids' data and designing user interfaces in a way that's meant to extend their time online, expose them to advertising, and give the platforms access to more data in order to better refine features that extend use and targeted advertising. And so I think a lot of our work in this space has been very focused on a sort of two-pronged approach. One is around data privacy and the other around safety by design. Um, I don't think, you know, I, I think this year we've started to see um, some push and pull on the debate sort of um, implying that advocates think that, um, you know, there's sort of a direct like um, solving these big tech issues will solve all the problems around teen mental health. I think that that's um, certainly not the case, certainly not a view that's shared by my organization or many of the folks that we advocate alongside. I think that what we are seeing is parents and youth advocates and organizations that are on the front lines of these issues seeing that families really need um, tools and help. And uh, we were at the hearing last month with quite a few parents who have unfortunately lost their kids um, to um, a range of horrifying online related harms. And um, you know, these are folks that had all kinds of parental settings, that had a lot of conversations with their kids. Um, but I think that, for me, one of the big takeaways from the hearing was that 
Um, there's an understanding across the aisle, on both sides of the aisle on Capitol Hill, that um, parents need help, that these companies have failed to self-regulate. I mean, part of the reason Mark Zuckerberg was getting so many questions is because of the information that we've learned through um, the lawsuits that um, many, many, many states now have brought against Instagram. Um, some of the things that have been unsealed, some of um, you know what's revealed in, in Meta's own internal research about the way its product impacts kids and teens. And so um, those are the things that are really sort of top of mind for us as we carry this advocacy forward. Um, you know, I think that while, again, you know, we're not attributing some sort of direct, um, you know, we'll solve all of, of teens' problems if we, if we regulate these issues, um, the fact is that there are features and functions that uh, exacerbate existing issues for kids as they're developing. We're talking about um, you know, young kids whose, whose prefrontal cortexes are very much not developed, who are very vulnerable to um, what we know are you know, scientific techniques to influence their behavior. Um, and so all that said, the hearing only means anything if we actually uh, see action from Congress. We've had many, many, many hearings. We've had, um, in the last couple of years, two very um, notable whistleblowers in Francis Haugen and Arturo Behar. And um, you know our our message has been and will continue to be that we we need to see action now. We've done enough talking. Okay, so <clears throat> there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, there's always been misinformation. There have been children who've had drug problems, or they've been bullied at school, or they've been they've been bullies. There's all kinds of things that have been going wrong in society for for centuries. Uh, but what's distinctive about the period that we're living in is the way in which digital technologies have put various of these problems on steroids. And there's therefore, in my mind, no question that the technology companies, being the masters, mistresses, bosses, whatever, of that technology, have a uniquely important role to play. The idea that the cops are going to sit on the networks monitoring stuff or watching stuff, it's, I mean, it's probably even scarier. It's a, it's a very scary notion, and it's not a practical notion. So the companies have to step up and take an important role. I can't think of a single area of law enforcement in my country, and I'm gathering it's the same here, that is, is adequately staffed to deal with any area of crime. They're, they're always under-resourced. That doesn't give the criminals a pass. It doesn't give other agencies uh, permission to ignore what they can do to help minimize or reduce crime. Now, I'm going to, I mean, age verification was something I was specifically asked to comment on because we've got, we've done various things in that field in the UK. And I'll, I'll start with a, a short story. So, in, in the UK, uh, your kids go from little school to big school at around age 11. So, when our kids went, like most parents, we opened up our kids their first bank accounts to help teach them how to manage money. We failed, which is why I'm a poor man. Uh, but nevertheless, routinely, as part of being given their bank accounts, aged 11, they were given debit cards. So around 2003, 2004, we, we began to hear cases reported to children's organizations, not my kids, I hasten to add, of children, typically boys, 14, 15 years of age, being clinically diagnosed as gambling addicts. And just so we're clear about that, what they were doing, they were getting their pocket money or their part-time earnings, putting it into their bank account and blowing it on a horse or a football match or, or whatever it might be. Now, our law is quite clear. You have to be at least 18 years old before you can gamble on anything. Online gambling has been possible you know, since the year dot, basically, in the UK. I know that the situation has been different here in the UK. I went to see all of the gamb big gambling companies, offices in the city of London, very expensive suits, wonderful boardrooms, all of that stuff. I said, you've got kids being diagnosed as gambling addicts coming onto your site. Uh, and they said, yeah, we take this problem very seriously. They, every, if I had a pound for every time I'd heard a tech executive say we take this problem very seriously, I'd probably be in the Bahamas now. But anyway, they all said the same thing. Uh, privately, uh, pr publicly, they said we take it very seriously. We were working on solutions. They did nothing. Privately, what they said was, of course, there is friction that we could in, enter into. We could engage on our platforms to try and detect kids or slow them down and things. But if we do it first, any of our, all of our competitors will basically steal our business. So none of the gambling companies did anything until we changed the law. And we changed the law in the 2005 Gambling Act. 
the relevant parts of which became operative on the 1st September 2007. Under that law, the Gambling Commission will not give you a license to operate a gambling website in the United Kingdom unless you can show that you've got a robust stage verification system in place. Since the 1st of September 2007, I'm not aware of a single case, not one, where a child has gone onto a website, ticked to say that they were 18, and then gone and blown their pocket money or, ga or gambled in any way at all. I'm not saying it hasn't happened. They may have impersonated their parents. They may have borrowed a parent's credit card. That's a different set of issues. But in relation to the gambling companies and the available technology that they had at their command, they had the means of doing that before the law changed. They didn't do it until the law compelled them to. And now we're going to do the same with pornography sites. But I might uh, come on to that later if you, if, if you want me to. Well, you know what? Actually, why don't, why don't we just dive into to that topic now? Um, you know, we're in a moment where there's a lot of state bills that are pushing this idea of parental age verification and getting parents, having youth get their parents' permission to use social media um, and sort of enhance parental controls. I think, you know, we heard even in the hearing just last month, I think it was the SNAP, uh, Evan, SNAP's Evan Spiegel, who said, you know, just 400,000 of our teenagers have enabled parental supervision. That's like 2% of their platform. Um, my own reporting shows that like, you know, meta safety experts have for years been concerned about this idea that like relying on parents to police their own kids' online activity um, might not be the most effective strategy. And yet it does seem like one, um, you know, that, that lawmakers and even parent advocates um, can embrace despite some of sort of the tricky technological issues. I'm wondering if you can all sort of reflect on, A, like what is the best way to verify kids' ages these days? And can we even rely on parents to police their own kids' activities? Uh, I think uh, our new legislation, the Online Safety Act 2023, which became law in uh, October last year, it's not yet fully implemented because the regulations are being drawn up. They have to go back to the government and then to parliament before they're operative. So we won't actually see any concrete action until probably towards the end of, uh, of this year. Parental education, digital literacy, all of these things are a crucial part of the total picture. But they are not an alternative to expecting and demanding that the tech companies do their best with, with the technology that, that they've got available and which they understand better than anybody else. If you, in the United Kingdom, under an agreement which I helped to negotiate in 2004, if you get a device which depends upon a SIM card, so a mobile device, typically a telephone, smartphone, whatever, uh, uh, then it will be, by default, uh, it will be assumed that you are a child. You will not be able to access pornography, gambling, alcohol, anything at all through that device from the word go unless and until you've been through an age verification process and it's established that the, the normal, everyday owner of that device is an adult. So, and this is typical of what happens in most with most consumer products. You deliver the consumer product in the safest possible way at the point of first use. Of course, if I wanted to kill myself with an electric fire, I could probably buy a very, very long flex plug it in at one end and then run into a swimming pool with the electric fire you know clasped to my chest there are certain ways in which you know if you're determined to mess things up you will mess things up my point is at the point of first use the tech companies should be under an obligation where children are likely to be most engaged with the product or the service to ensure that it's as safe as it possibly can be Parents, of course, can liberalize the settings if they want to, but at the point of first use, it should be in its safest possible condition. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I very much agree with a, a lot of what John just said. Um, I think that um, platforms have been very enthusiastic about legislation around parental permission to access. Um, the parents we talk to are very clear that that doesn't really solve many of the problems because the choice a parent faces then is do I socially isolate my kid and deny that permission or do I say okay and then they have access to a platform that just has all the same problems because all we've done is passed a permission to access regulation. Um, and I also very much will just agree with the sentiment that you know the strongest default settings and protections need to be in place um, you know, when a, a child accesses the platform and 
Um, and I think that that's you know, an important piece of this conversation as we think about what these state parental permission bills mean. Yeah, if I can add on, I mean, I think you know, the, the problem we have with age verification in the United States is, I mean, basically right now we're in a world where we assume everyone's an adult unless they affirmatively say they're a child. And a lot of the proposals on the table are to assume everyone's a child unless you, you prove that you're an adult. And for many adults, you know, there are privacy concerns with that. And for many children, there are privacy concerns with that. And I think it is, um, you know, when we're talking about, for example, some of these state laws, like Utah, right? This is a state that, you know, they, they've said that, you know, they think some of these apps are so unsafe, they can't be on government devices, yet they want to have a law that says, you know, every parent has to now upload a copy of their ID and give it, give a copy of their personal ID to these same apps. There's a, a serious, you know, conflict there. And I, I think, you know, we need to have alternative options. And so, for example, one of the options that um, ITIF has come out with, and, and we're looking for others like this, are ways that, you know, empower parents with something like a, a trusted, um, you know, child flag that you can attach to a device. So you can put it in a child mode. Um, and then once you give it to them, you know, every, every app, every um, site you visit after that would have to respect that child flag if it's an adult-oriented site. Something like that gets around having to verify IDs, having to verify age. It's no longer about you know, this kind of uh, legalistic, you know, are you 18 or are you 16 or whatever threshold we want to put, which you know, the problem with that is you know, one, it's kind of substituting government uh, oversight for parental oversight. And you know, two, not all children are the same, right? Some 16-year-olds probably can handle certain things that 18-year-olds can and, and vice versa. And there's such a wide range. And so, you know, creating something like a trusted child flag is basically saying, can we take the ecosystem we already have of some of these controls that you mentioned that aren't being well used and think about how can we actually make them so that they are well used? Well, one of the problems, one of the reasons parents don't use these, um, you know, child safety features right now is because there's so many of them. You have to go and you have to figure out the one for this social network and then another social network and then this device and another device. And there's no interoperability between any of that. So our point is, why don't we work on actually making this all work together so that you can give one child one device, you can set screen time that you know, applies across a Chromebook and an iPad um, and their Windows device. Uh, you, know, you, can, you can do much more with that than trying to say, OK, you know, we're going to ban certain types of features on certain types of social media sites or require you know, everyone to display their ID. We know people don't want to do that, and there's huge resistance. And it's, because you know, people rightly are concerned with their privacy. Wow, my head's going to explode. Um, you know, I agree, John, that we should be providing the, the safest possible environment for kids. I've spent my whole life working toward that goal. But I think that when we talk about the public safety aspects of this problem, which we do not talk about nearly enough, we're overlooking the fact that we're not talking about having, like I live in a town of 3,000 people, 30 miles north of Boston. We have a wonderful little police department. We're not talking about having policemen sit on the systems, right? We're talking about breaking up global criminal enterprises that are not just terrorizing kids, they're terrorizing the companies too. And so at some point, we skip this part of the conversation. You know, there was, so I was reading the other night that there was this, uh, the, this is from one of the uh, pro-parent groups. The U.S. has traditionally put the onus on parents to supervise their children's online experience. However, this doesn't get to the root of the problem of how companies design platforms to maximize engagement. Okay, we skipped a huge element there, which is that as crime moved from the real world into cyberspace, we have a, forget a legal obligation, we have a moral obligation to tackle that, and we're not doing it. Why, why are we even bothering to collect the cyber tips if something like 3,000 out of every 100,000 cyber tips are even examined? I mean, the, the notion that we are doing enough to protect kids in this conversation is preposterous. And quite frankly, by shifting the blame directly to the tech companies, we're missing a huge opportunity to protect kids. We talk about data privacy. I see my good friend, the Newman to my Seinfeld, Rick Lane is here, and Rick and I banter about encryption all the time. So I've spent a lot of time 
working on identity theft in children. It's a huge problem. If you think the problems of exploitation online are a problem, come look at those numbers. And so I've had a lot of concerns about weakening encryption. I mean, if my dad was an FBI agent, sure, we want to help law enforcement. But I mean, what's next? We just strip away the Miranda warnings? We've got to find a better way to do this. And encryption is the backbone of protecting not just kids, but every single consumer. We talk about children and data privacy. Hello? It's a nightmare. Um, you know, let's talk again about some of the meta plaintiffs, because I've been looking at these states for 40 years. I started my work in California, where they were routinely issuing multiple social security numbers to kids so they could make multiple Title IV claims to the feds for their kids in foster care. If you're a child in foster care, you're, we're talking about meta-monetizing kids' data without parental consent. If you're a child that enters the foster care system in any state but Maryland, and you have social security benefits, the state is taking them from you without anybody's permission, and you're leaving the foster care system destitute. So I guess I'm finding this whole conversation a little troubling because I see a huge disconnect between the lack of outrage about those practices that are going on in the real world and by a lot of the people who are now directing attention to the tech companies because it directs attention away from them. And I think that there's a lack of consistency. I mean, we could talk about Utah all day, OK? These state rules that are being put forth, uh, let's just use my favorite example, my least favorite Democrat, Gavin Newsom. OK, so <laughs> Can Gavin we wait Newsom, on Gavin Newsom for one second? So, do you mind? Hmm? Do we, can we wait on Gavin Newsom for sure, one second? Sure, but we're going to get to Gavin sure. Newsom. <laughs> can I, can I, I just talk. make a? There is a project which I'm chairman of, which is trying to develop an international framework for doing age verification. So the problem that you were mentioning about having to jump between different platforms, different mm -hmm. methods for doing it, should be solved. It was originally funded by the European Union. It's now funded by the UN. I'm the chairman of its advisory board. So we recognize the point, the problem that you've raised, and it should become smoother and easier to... Meta is part of the the experiment that we're involved in, and other tech companies are as well. Could I just add, though, you know, I, I think it's important that, uh, you know, no one's really objecting to, um, you know, gambling sites and, and keeping children off that. I mean, the, the questions come up when we're talking about sites and menu services that have, you know, a, a broad range of users that are, you know, uh, I, I think about, you know, if you look at how children, you know, the children are most likely to be, uh, have amputations because of lawnmowers, right? We could have ID checks for lawnmowers so that you know you can't push a lawnmower if you're under the age of 18, but we don't, right? We we expect parents to be responsible in this space, and we expect there to be a balance. That doesn't mean we sell lawnmowers that are intentionally dangerous. We do have safety standards, but I think this is where we need more of a balance and more of a respect for you know the fact that there are going to be you know multiple types of uh, you know parents and standards and what we want out there, and it can't just be you know, treat everything like a gambling site on the internet, because they're not. Um, I think one of the, so one of the laws that was getting a lot of sort of airplay during the hearing was COSA, the Kids Online Safety Act. Um, and, you know, that would establish some reasonable measures that tech companies could take to prevent harm. But it's been controversial, right? Because I think there's some who are concerned that, um, you know, that it might empower state attorneys generals to limit certain types of content for vulnerable youths like our LGBT communities. I'm wondering, and Maureen, I want to start with you, if you don't mind, um, just because you brought up Newsom. <laughs> um, if you, um, you know, who, how do we even define what is harmful content for kids? And should the state attorneys generals in some of these states really be the decider of like, what's, what's actually harming our kids or not? God, no. I mean, first of all, it was, I think it was Justice Potter Stewart who said he knew pornography when he saw it. So it's a very subjective um, no, matter. So one of the reasons that I've become so concerned about the role that state attorneys general have played in all of this is that, A, no individual state is regulating the internet, right? And also, as Child welfare and adoption, another issue that I do a lot of work on over the years, have been generally viewed as state law issues. They have become so fundamentally interstate and intercountry activity that I don't believe that the states can adequately 
control or enforce them anyway. I mean, one of the reasons that I frankly pulled away from supporting COSA is that the state attorneys general are not enforcing their existing child welfare statutes, much less adding all this new stuff on that they're not experts in to begin with. So here's the Gavin Newsom example of why leaving it up to the states is a bad idea. So Gavin Newsom had this you know, flashy press conference talking about a bill that California passed that was supposed to be fantastic and solve the problem and protect children in California. And at the same time, they were letting thousands of pedophiles out of prison on early release. One guy served a whopping two days in the LA County Jail for a pretty gruesome crime. Now, this is a crime that has arguably the highest recidivism rate of any category of criminal activity. And taking, first of all, that it was a miracle that any of these guys were convicted, because one of my concerns is that the conviction rates, as against the cyber tip numbers, are negligible. So really, Gavin, I'm not really that interested in having you or Mr. Bond to do anything that has to do with protecting children, because there's a fundamental hypocrisy to that kind of disconnected thinking. And as far as the states are concerned, what we're talking about is dramatically interstate activity most of the time. There is no way that they can really wrap their arms around it. So these state laws have just become this performative exercise. So I'm really not, at this moment, I'm not going to support any bill, A, that doesn't focus on the criminal justice aspects of the problem, and B, that leaves anything up to the state attorneys general, because I just don't think that they've done a good job with kids, not just on this, but on anything. Others have a viewpoint? I might add um, to this conversation. I think that um, there has been a lot of important discussion around the Kids Online Safety Act and the duty of care over the past almost two years now. You know, I think the bill in its current iteration is, is pretty clear that it's not meant to impact the existence of any single piece of content. It um, says very clearly in, in um, a rule of construction in the duty of care that um, this isn't about um, a child searching. Um, I think that there's an important distinction to be made between holding platforms responsible for the mere existence of content, which is protected under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, and the decisions they make about what they are actually promoting into our feeds um, because they are um, you know, training algorithms and, and, and targeting metrics. And um, we know that um, more outrageous content gets more eyeballs and, and therefore ends up pushed onto feeds. And so you know, I think that's an important piece of this conversation as we continue to talk about you know, how we can conceptualize um, conceptualize COSA. Um, I also think that the text um, in its current iteration is, is clear that it runs to the design and operation of the platforms. Um, and uh, that's really what we're trying to get at is that features and functions are just simply not the same as just the mere existence of content. I, can I just make a, a, a quick uh, comeback on that point about sub, the state substituting parents' rights? Absolutely not how we see it in Europe. Uh, what we see, and I might remind you, the United States of America is the only country in the world that's not signed the United Nations. Oh, I Convention have a lot to say about that, John. But, and, and they're but, never going to. So it's no, kind of I a know, false I know analogy. That's not immense, immensely relevant right now. The point is, we accept that the state has an obligation to help parents, particularly in complex areas like this. What is it? Uh, Apple figures less than. 1% of Apple users actually use any of the safety tools that they've, they've put on there. It's quite clear that there is a disconnect between what we expect and hope and would like parents to do and what's actually happening. And what we're saying in, with our legislation in the United Kingdom is that's over. We're not going to take fine words from uh, tech executives about their hopes and aspirations. We're not going to let them mark their own homework anymore. This is a key piece of our new legislation. There will be legal obligations on tech companies to report in detail the risk assessments that they're taking in relation to how child users of their service are actually faring uh, in terms of that service and the steps that they're taking to make sure that those problems are minimized or disappear. And if they tell lies, and by the way, they have done in the past, somebody will go to jail 
because another unique feature of our legislation is there are criminal sanctions being attached to the reporting obligations under our legislation. And I expect, uh, we, we'll see how it works. We have a new regulator that will be undertaking the work here, but we've had it with fine words and promises from tech executives. That period is ended. We're in a new era where the state is felt it had, and by the way, this went through with all party support. Nobody voted against this legislation when it went through the British Parliament. That is extremely rare, extremely unusual, but it happened. So, it, so can I, John, I, you know, I emailed you about this over the weekend. You know, the tech companies are not shielded from federal criminal prosecution right now. And quite frankly, one of the reasons that I am so keen on law enforcement is that they shouldn't be marking their own homework. If there are companies out there that are conspiring with groups like the Yahoo Boys, for instance, let's put them in jail. There is absolutely no scenario in which existing US law does not provide exactly the sanctions that suicide, you're seeking. Well, John, here's the thing. You can, you can talk about that stuff all you want. And I agree that we want to have safe platforms. But there, you have skipped over the entire discussion of public safety. And so if you're dealing with, I, I'm working with a victim of sex extortion right now. She's a lovely young woman. It's amazing how she's come back from a horrible experience. But really, do you think that any platform can push back on an international global ring of sex extortionists? without some help? You think that all of these issues that we're talking about no. cannot be bolstered, in fact, strengthened, by having a public safety response to? They're OK. Not, they're not alternatives. And then, it, and then I just have to address this US versus the world thing. The US framework of child welfare law is very different from international standards. I've worked all over the world, OK? The US is never going to ratify the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, for better or worse, because our framework around children is more like property law than human rights law. OK, that just is what it is. OK, but I'll, at the same time, I've looked at, in detail at the global law enforcement response to this problem. And guess what? Nobody's doing a good job, right? Why? Because there isn't enough investment in public safety. There isn't enough investment in collaboration. There isn't enough focus on the criminal activity that is fueling the victimization of kids. I've, I've got eight children, OK? Two daughters and six stepchildren, who I all, all of whom I raised, 17 grandchildren. Those kids range in age from 56 to 6. So I've seen every possible application in my own family of the evolution of technology. And, I, and would that it were so simple that a company could just wave a magic wand and create a safe space. But if we're not creating a safe space for the company to do business in, they're certainly not going to be able to create a safe space for kids. And I'm not here to defend the tech companies. But I am here to tell you that I've been doing this for a long time. And I can tell you that if you ignore the criminal activity that is fueling the suicide rates, and by the way, this whole discussion of mental health has a lot to do with a lot of things and not technology. And by the way, I haven't heard anybody talk about the positive things that technology does for kids right I, this minute. I do want to get there, actually. Well, okay, well, let's do get there because it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's an important part of the conversation. Yeah. yeah, I agree. If I can just, I want to put a fine point on, on why COSA is a problem at the state level. And I mean, the problem is if you look around the past year, we've had these heated debates in many states around book bans and other types of content where you know, we are seeing state legislators substituting their view about what, and it, we see this at, uh, you know, at the lower level of school boards as well, substituting their view about what content is appropriate and what content is not. And even though the legislation says they're not you know, trying to focus on any specific content, I mean, just think of this last hearing that we saw and think about what that hearing would look like if a law like COSA was on the books. Every CEO, would be, you know, they'd have a parade of content from third party content and saying, why did you think this was appropriate for children? Did you not have a duty of care to take this down? And we would just see more of the same political theater where it will be about the content. It will be very subjective about what content is allowable and what content is not. And to the point about, you know, are we actually helping children at the end of this? 
I mean, one of the concerns I have with a lot of these bills is it's basically taking more and more of the internet away from children. And the idea is, of course, you know, they're saying, well, we're doing this in ways to protect children. We're also taking a lot of the value away from children. And increasingly, what's left for children on the internet isn't very useful, unless you have money to pay for um, you know, paid software, paid apps, paid services. So you know, if you want the future of the internet to benefit children of all backgrounds, those who can afford things and those who can't, we need an ad-supported internet that actually delivers value. Now, we want to make sure we're not delivering them harmful ads, but it will be ad-supported, just like much of you know, other public content that we have on broadcast TV was ad-supported content. I think you guys, both of you actually talked a little bit about some of the promises of social media. And I think one of the things we actually heard some of the tech CEOs talk about is, you know, actually a lot of teens, their whole lives are on social media, right? Like they find connection, they find communities, they find people they wouldn't maybe have otherwise met. Um, most people who use social media don't face the tragic stories that we heard about during the hearing. Um, and I think there is starting to be an argument about, you know, is there a sense in which some of this is a bit of a moral panic? Like, are we just sort of fretting about social media in the same way that we might be once fretted about video games or other sorts of television and other sorts of technology? And I'm wondering if you all, um, you know, can reflect on that idea and what you might tell regular parents about how concerned we actually should be. Um, about some of the risks we've discussed here today. I'll start briefly. I, I think the comparison with video games is very appropriate. I mean, if I think back you know, to Columbine, right? And right after Columbine, people were looking for something to blame and, and what they could do. And the answer then was video games. Video games was seen as the problem. And video games, you know, we've seen clearly, you know, regulating that would not have addressed all the school shootings we've seen since then. There were other problems there. I think the same thing is going on with social media, where you know, part of the frustration I think a lot of parents have, myself included with this debate, is it takes attention away from the real issues. You know, if we're talking about real issues that are going to help children, more law enforcement, better safety nets for children, more counseling, I mean, there's so much more that we can be doing to help children address children's need. And it's not about you know, whether we're having autoplay on videos on social media. Those aren't the big issues. Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I think about how, you know, kids used to go to school on horseback and now they ride school buses that might crash, you know. There's, a, there's always a generational thing that goes on here. But, you know, at the moment, the Ukrainian government is looking for tens of, tens of thousands of children that were abducted by the Russians. And how are they doing that? They're using AI. And they're using AI to scrape the images that the Russians are putting out of the kids and they're matching them with the images they got from the parents that reported them missing. And they're geotagging their pictures. And guess what? We know where 23,000 of those kids are probably. We look at the way that over a million kids have been adopted from foster care in the last 20 years that probably would have had a really hard time finding families if it weren't for the internet. We look at all of the educational applications of kids. During COVID, I mean, good Lord, kids would have been dead in the water without having some technology access to education, to mental health services, and from where I sit, looking at a massively underserved population of kids of all kinds, we look at technology as the, as the new frontier in terms of, de of delivering adequate mental health services in particular to all kinds of children for all kinds of reasons. But when you talk about a moral panic, Naomi, I think there's, a, there's another aspect of this that you know, really hasn't been discussed, and that is opportunism. And so when people started to figure out that they might be able to sue the tech companies who have some pretty deep pockets, that seemed like a pretty attractive alternative. Now, again, I look at that and go, OK, they're mandated reporters. So if you're going to start to sue them, you need to start suing your pastor, your school teacher, your school nurse, all the other mandated reporters. And in the meantime, by the way, because they're not mandated reporters, let's go after the gun manufacturers because they're shielded from liability and they kill a lot more kids than Facebook does. So I think that there has been this sort of, um, sort of a masterful manipulation of the message that has departed sharply from what you know, I would consider and a lot of other people would consider to be best practices in child welfare. Mandated reporting has been around since 1974. And thank God it is, because it saved a lot of kids' lives. As far as the issues of suicide and other 
side effects of being victimized by criminals. Well, I say, let's just give it a shot. Let's see what happens if we go after the organized criminal enterprise on the internet. Because you know what I think will happen? It'll be safer. And it'll be safer for everybody. Just some thoughts. Other thoughts? My issue with the moral panic framing is that these harms have been realized. They're not imaginary. We have a lot of youth advocates and a lot of families saying they need help. Um, I think there are many wonderful things for kids and teens online and you know, our driving sort of um, motivation behind this advocacy is that they should be able to learn and play and socialize you know, free from some of these incentives that currently exist because of a lack of regulation. Kids are not going onto a social media feed and just seeing what their friends have posted. They are seeing things that are being pushed to them because a platform has decided it is such in order for it to be profitable. And so, um, you know, I, I think the fact is that we talk with families week in and week out who have experienced the very worst of this and have struggled very mightily against it. And um, this isn't something imaginary. We've got the American Psychological Association and the US Surgeon General saying these features and functions um, will exacerbate issues for kids and overcome um, their own sort of developing sense of things like when to log off and go outside. Uh, and that's why um, you know, taking action is so necessary. Of course, the internet's been hugely beneficial for the vast majority of children and society as a whole. I mean, we're not here to celebrate. Oh, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the bits that are still not getting uh, the right degree of attention. Um, and the damage that's done to children through something the way that you've just described it is huge and, li and li life, life, uh, lifelong. So what would, what I suppose in, in the UK, what we've basically said is we're going to compel you to do the stuff that you've been saying you want to do because we don't think you're doing it consistently enough. We don't think you're de developing enough resource, de devoting enough resources to it. So we're going to put the force of law behind it. We're going to make you honest. We're going to make you keep the promises that you've been making um, with your fine words over so many years, which so far have, pro have not produced a good enough result. And can I just say on the child sex abuse thing, if you looked at my bibliography, the subject I've written most about and lectured most on is victims of child sexual abuse on, mm -hmm. on the internet. It's in, but that, that's a very, very serious, huge issue, and I'm not trying to minimize or reduce it in any way whatsoever, but there are a whole set of other things too that have very little to do with organized crime and everything to do with the way algorithms work. Oh, oh John, all right. <laughs> now, now we're having some fun. <clears throat> Listen, I um, started working with the Boston Globe Spotlight team on the Catholic Church abuse cases in mm, 2001. Most of that abuse didn't happen on the internet, okay? You, so this, again, the moral panic aspect of this sort of ignores the underlying cultural issues, the underlying criminal issues, and the underlying just sense of well-being of children. And, you know, at some point, and God knows as a mother, I feel this keenly, we have to also make a decision of where do we as parents draw the line? Where do we as parents take control of our children's lives? I can tell you right now, because I have spent over almost 40 years looking at it, the government makes a terrible parent. And there are right this minute 500,000 kids in foster care here to tell you that that is true. So it really concerns me, as much as I am concerned about child safety, that we hand any of these overarching decisions to the government, especially when it might be elected officials whose ideological positions will change from administration to administration, and take it away from parents. And if you look at what's happened to the real world's child welfare system, which is really with what I call family policing had some very damaging effects, not necessarily a world we want to build in cyberspace. 
Maureen, you might have gotten in the last word because <laughs> we've run out of time. I don't know that there was any more agreement here on this panel as there was in Congress last month. Um, but obviously, this is an important issue that we'll have to continue discussing as we figure out what the right policy solutions are. Um, so thank you for sharing your perspectives, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Well done.